Welcome to Rachel's Dream. In today's episode, we explore the remarkable tales of how the humble hat pin became a powerful tool for self-defense, often wielded by women in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The hat pin, initially a fashionable accessory, transformed into a symbol of empowerment for women facing harassment or assault. Its innocuous appearance belied its effectiveness as a defensive weapon. The following was written in the New York Times in 1904. What shall we do in case we are attacked by some thief or ruffian? As the question woman have asked in every part of the country. The man to whom the question is put will generally answer, carry our revolver. But women dread revolvers. Few women possess the nerve necessary to use a pistol with effect when attacked. Then there is the objection to a revolver in the possession of a woman that she would be averse to suspecting the motive of every man she met and would probably fail to draw the revolver until too late for fear of making a foolish mistake. What then can be provided for her that will be formidable to a foe, yet absolutely safe, so far as she is concerned and ever ready at hand, whether wanted for use or not? The answer to the puzzle has been provided by those who make women's hat pins. A hat pin has been designed that is intended primarily for use as a weapon of defense. It is in reality a stiletto masquerading as an innocent hat pin. It is made of fine steel that will bend but will not break, as sharp as a needle, and hardened at the end so that it can be used with deadly effect as a dagger and a handle that enables a woman to grasp it for use as a weapon and hold it so that it cannot easily be pulled from her hand. There are two ways of holding this hat pin. It can be held with the thumb pressed against the top or with the button grasped in the palm of the hand. In either way, it is a weapon not to be despised. The method of using it to the best advantage when attacked is to aim at the face of the highwayman. A woman armed with one of these stilettos is able to do more damage in a few seconds than a man unarmed. The wicked little blade is so small that it is impossible to grasp it, to wrench it away from her. And yet so keen is it that, thrust home by a woman, frenzied by fear, it is likely to pierce through any ordinary clothing into a vital part of a highwayman's anatomy. There are times in most women's lives when a suspicious looking character comes into the offing and prudence whispers, beware of him. While most women would shrink under these circumstances from pulling out a revolver, it is an innocent act to put the hand to the hat and draw out one of her stiletto-like hat pins. With this in her hand, the nervous woman is ready for the stranger, whatever his intentions. If he is an honest man, he will probably take no notice of the woman's action. If he is a thief, it is more than probable that he will mark the act and let the woman pass unmolested. Anecdotes abound of brave women using hat pins to fend off attackers. In this first story, we meet Loretta O'Brien. When she was confronted with her sister and her sister's husband, John Brooks, who were quarreling. Mrs. Loretta O'Brien of Brooklyn, New York, thought herself justified in using her hat pin. During this incident, which occurred on March 20th, 1903, O'Brien jabbed Brooks in the face with her hat pin, which broke in half. It took physicians at the hospital an hour to remove the pieces lodged in the victim's face. The couple had started to quarrel during Loretta's visit when she entered the fray with her hat pin. She said that both her sister and her husband turned on her, causing her to act in self-defense. The point of the pin entered Brooks's face just below the left eye, passed through the roof of his mouth and penetrated the tongue. She was arrested, but said the news account, no serious outcome is anticipated. That is, unless blood poisoning set in. A later story revealed that 23-year-old Loretta 
was being held on a charge of having stabbed 32-year-old Brooks. When the pin broke off, it left about four inches of steel in his flesh. According to this account, when the couple started to argue, Loretta took her sister's side, whereupon Brooks ordered her to get out of his house. As she was somewhat slow to leave, Brooks started to physically put her out. Loretta thought he was going to strike her, and so she stabbed him with her hat pin. An ambulance was called and Brooks was transported to the hospital. Loretta was arrested. In another sensational case that involved references to alcohol and other drugs, actress Catherine Neal was suspected of having murdered her husband with a hat pin. Joseph M. Neal, described as a well-to-do athlete, was found dead in a room in the Greenwich Hotel in Greenwich, Connecticut, in the middle of December, 1906. Witnesses had seen him walk into the room a short time earlier in the company of a woman. One day later, the woman, believed to be his wife of a few weeks, was arrested in New York City. An autopsy on Neil's body showed that death had been caused by a hat pin that had penetrated his brain. A few days later, it was reported that authorities were still investigating the death. While the police continued holding actress Catherine Neal, the victim's widow. Officials then had a theory that the woman, under the influence of drugs, may have murdered her husband while in an abnormal condition of mind, believing herself another person. Those officials thought she was a morphine fiend and possibly a modern Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Mrs. Neal claimed her husband died from heart trouble after a major drinking spree. The title of this article was Lowlife Murder. Some 10 days later, it was announced that Goldie Neal would be tried for the murder of her husband. In this account, it was argued that she killed him by pushing either a hat pin or a nail file into his brain by inserting in behind the eyeball. She had admitted to the police that she had two husbands, but excuses this on the plea that she thought the first one, William H. Finley, a policeman, was dead. Goldie gave her age as 25. It was charged that Goldie, in a fit of anger and after prolonged dissipation from her reckless husband, placed a sharp instrument, either a hat pin or a nail file, into his brain. He was dying when his wife called for medical aid. According to the physician, Goldie contended that, that her husband fell on a knife while intoxicated. She took a night train to New York City immediately after her husband's death, promising to return. She did not return and an investigation was launched, which culminated in her arrest. Then she declared that her husband committed suicide. Goldie explained bruises on her face and arms by saying her husband had treated her cruelly. A few weeks earlier, she obtained a divorce from her first husband, who was a member of the New York City Police Department. Immediately thereafter, she married Neil, a former prize fighter and blacksmith. He paid the cost of the divorce proceedings. Neil was partial to drink, and it was alleged that he forced his wife to drink with him and that he dragged her down to his moral level. Historically, women faced various dangers in urban environments, prompting the need for a discreet means of protection. The hat pin became a symbol of empowerment, offering a sense of security and autonomy. Women learned to wield these seemingly innocuous accessories as effective defensive weapons when faced with harassment or potential attacks. The societal context of that era, where women were often subjected to limited rights and faced societal constraints, led to the hatpins transformation into a means of self-preservation. Its use symbolized women's resourcefulness and their determination to safeguard themselves in public spaces. In the modern era, while hatpins have largely faded from everyday fashion, their historical significance remains relevant in discussions surrounding self-defense and empowerment. The concept of using discrete 
everyday objects for protection persists today, albeit in different forms. The hat pin's legacy serves as a reminder of the ongoing pursuit of personal safety and empowerment for marginalized groups, with lessons about resourcefulness and adaptation echoing in contemporary discussions about self-defense and personal security. The hat pin remains a testament to women's resourcefulness in an era when their safety was often at risk. Its legacy endures as a symbol of both fashion and empowerment. Join us next time as we uncover more fascinating stories from the annals of history. This is Christopher Lee signing off from Rachel's Dream, a podcast series brought to you by Siri Enyon.